guys, today I want to talk with you about The Notes on an Execution, a thriller by Dania Kukavka that was published in 2022. As per usual, we will start this video with a short synopsis, then proceed to the non-spoiler review and wrap this video up with the spoilers. If you haven't read The Notes on an Execution yet, then do not worry. I will make sure to let you know when the spoilers begin. In the notes on an execution, we meet a man named Ansel Packer. Due to the crimes he has committed, he is scheduled to die in 12 hours. Ansel is well aware of what he has done and he knows what is about to come. His only wish in this life right now is to be understood. However, while this is a story about Ansel, at the same time it isn't. This story is not even about his victims. This story is about the people whose lives changed because of Ansel. In the novel, we get to follow Lavender, Ansel's mother, Hazel, Ansel's wife's twin sister, and Safi, the detective whose determination landed Ansel in prison. This is a story of the woman left behind. So as I mentioned previously, in this novel we get to follow four different POVs, Ansel's, Lavender's, Hazel's and Safi's, as well as we get to see some of the events that are happening in the span of decades. And I thought that this was brilliant. I loved this book. I picked it up from the local library without even properly reading the synopsis of it, and as soon as I started to read about Lavender's life, I knew that this is going to be a novel that will leave an impact on me. And I wasn't wrong. When you look at the plot of Notes on an Execution, it's very clear that the book is far from your typical thriller. Yes, this book has a lot of elements that are usually associated with crime thrillers, such as flawed but likable protagonists, a multi-layered villain, and several entertaining plot twists. Yet at the same time, you start this book knowing that Ansel is guilty. You know he committed the crimes, you know that he was caught and is being punished for them. And even though you don't instantly learn what was the crime, you know that it was bad enough to warrant a death sentence. In addition to that, none of these crimes are being described in detail, and if you put them all together, they probably wouldn't take more than a page in this whole novel. There's no explicit violence shown in this book, there are no cliffhangers, and yet somehow the general atmosphere of it is still very grim and suspenseful, as well as all of the characters feel multi-layered and interesting to read about. Besides that, Notes on an Execution asks a variety of important, thought-provoking questions. Can you still consider yourself to be a good person, even when you are ridden with jealousy? How far can you go before there is no way back to the innocent person that you once were? Does capital punishment truly avenges the victims, or does it give an out to the perpetrator? Do people who hurt others really have some grandiose motives for doing so, or is it just us, the people, who need to find the reason for brutal actions? Does the attention we give to the criminals take away the attention we are willing to give to their victims? And even when we do acknowledge said victims, why do we only tend to see them like that? Like the worst thing that ever happened to them, and not like the riveting people they once were. Now, as a true crime lover myself, I do see how thin of a line there is between enjoying true crime in order to learn more about the world that surrounds us, as well as getting that rush of adrenaline while still being in a safe and controlled environment and criminal glorification. It is not a secret that true crime generally tends to focus more on the perpetrator rather than the victims. Ted Bundy, Harold Shipman, Jeffrey Dahmer, there are multiple books, movies, TV shows, and documentaries exploring their lives, their characters, and their motivations for the crimes committed. And for every hundred people who have heard of Jack the Ripper, I bet you could only find one person that is familiar with the names of Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Edouise, or Mary Jane Kelly, his victims. That being said, in the last years, we can also start to see the shift in the media where more and more books that focus on the victims and amplify the voices of survivors are being published. 
Notes on an execution, while not necessarily spending much time concentrating on the actual victims, still spends a lot of it giving the attention to other people besides our villain. Ansel, more or less, is simply being used as a stepping stone. A secondary character whose existence helps us to better understand the characters and the actions and motivations of the real protagonists. This novel, while not your typical crime thriller, is still a remarkable, heart-wrenching, and necessary read for anyone interested in the genre. And on this note, we will move to the spoiler review so we could explore the woman and the events of this book in a little more detail. If you haven't read the notes on an execution yet, now is a great time for you to click off this video. Okay, so let's take some time to talk about the three women in this novel, as well as the impact Ansel had on their lives. Even though the very first chapter introduces us to Ansel and is written from his POV, I would argue that the actual story starts with Lavender in 1973. This chapter probably was my favorite part of this whole book. It was filled with so much emotion. Now, don't get me wrong, it was very difficult to read, but the author portrays the hopelessness, the fear, and abolition so damn perfectly that I got shivers down my spine just by reading it. Lavender had a sucky life. Her mom was clearly not a very caring person. She got infatuated with Johnny when she was so very young, and I do believe that him being older made it also easier for him to manipulate Lavender to accept life on his terms. I mean, as far as we know, Lavender just quit on her dreams, quit on her friend and her family, and just moved in with Johnny, giving away all of her safety net and letting him make decisions on basically everything. First time we meet Lavender, she's giving birth to Ansel. And all the information we got about that is that instead of going to the hospital, Johnny carried her to the barn. And while my first reaction to this was somewhere between the lines of, well, maybe there just wasn't enough time to reach the hospital, or maybe this is some kind of prohibited love situation and going to the hospital would uh, tear them apart. Once Ansel was born and I realized that Johnny's forcing Lavender to walk herself back into the house right away after giving birth, barefoot, dizzy and tired and cold, and instead of helping her out or taking care of the newborn, he just went straight to sleep. Now, this one scene instantly made the dynamic of their marriage, the life Lavender is living, crystal clear. And as the story progresses, we see just how unhappy Lavender is. She feels trapped. She would go out and scream from the top of her lungs just to see if anyone would come. She didn't leave the property in years. She wasn't even allowed to take Ansel to the hospital after his gut got infected. She was forced to count on her husband for everything. While Johnny spent his time gaslighting her, coercing her into sex, abusing both Lavender and their sons. I felt sick to my stomach reading about her life and the life of her children, being starved, beaten, scared, neglected, and imprisoned. I guess that at the end of the day, it can be argued that Lavender did abandon her children, but honestly, in my opinion, she did more than I expected her to do just by calling the police. I expected her to simply run away. Generally speaking, she did put herself first. While she did turn her back on her children, I saw her being depressed after giving birth, abused for years. I saw how she was living in a survival mode for so long that getting herself out of that situation was the only thing she could care about and I just couldn't blame her for it. Honestly, by the end of her chapter, I did believe that Lavender committed suicide. It obviously wasn't said that she did, but this whole scene of her running away and then stopping by the water just screamed to me that this is actually how all of it will end for her. I was so sure of it that I was honestly surprised when after a while Lavender's story got picked up again and we got to know how her life actually turned out. And while I can't say that she had a good life, especially not for the first years after her escape, 
by the end of the book, we see that Lavender found peace. She created a new home with someone she loved. She got to know how life turned out for her children, and she stayed in contact with her granddaughter. And while it's not a guilt-free life, it's still a better life that she would have had with Johnny. Meanwhile, Safi must have been the most interesting character for me to follow. We first meet her as a girl from an orphanage. A girl who has never met her father, who has lots of fond memories of her mother, strong friendships with the fellow girls in the house, and a massive crush on Ansel. A crush that soon enough turns into one of the most defining relationships in Safi's life. We see Safi being obsessed with Ansel over the years. After finding the dead fox in her bed, we see her asking for a transfer to a different home despite being actually happy and having real friends in this one. Later on, we get to know that she got into drugs, which I also feel can be partially blamed on Ansel. Yes, Safi herself had a shitty life, which could have led her to an addiction, whether she had met Ansel or not, but this need to use drugs in order to disappear, in order to forget, to me felt very much like a trauma response. I mean, she had a crush on a boy who left a dead animal in her bed when she was just a child. She liked someone who turned out to be more than willing to hurt her in return. That must have had an impact on her perception of people and relationships. As I have said before, I did not actually read the full synopsis of Notes on an Execution before reading the book, so I had no idea that Safi would grow up to be the one responsible for making Ansel pay for his crimes. The moment I realized that this little girl with a crush is going to be the detective who will put him to prison was the moment I felt like I needed to stop and simply applaud Danya Skukafka's genius. Making her and Ansel have history together, making Ansel to be the person who unintentionally set Safi on this path of self-destruction makes her obsession with him more justified, easier to understand. Now when it comes to the question of whether Safi was right in telling Blue and her mother the truth about Ansel, I do not know. On one hand, Blue needed to know the truth. On the other hand, I really do not think that Blue was in any actual danger. I just don't see Ansel ever attacking his own blood. That being said, there is one thing I know for sure, and that is that Safi is not responsible for the death of Jenny. In my eyes, it was only a matter of time until Ansel attacked again, and him losing his school and going after Jenny after Blue pushed him away was only an unfortunate domino effect. I honestly appreciated how by the end of the book, Safi is happy and fulfilled in her life, and yet she is still Safi. She doesn't crave a partner or children to feel like her life is complete. She found happiness by finding justice for Lila, by being part of her friend's life, doing the job she cares about, and by finally closing a chapter on Ansel. Now lastly, I feel like I do not have that much what to say about Hazel. Since more often than not, I felt rather confused by the author's choice of giving us the POV of Hazel and not Jenny. I mean, I kind of understand that Jenny would have been a little too close to Ansel, and consequently her story could have become too intertwined with his, making it easier for Ansel's story to take over. But what we see of Hazel didn't actually give me a good read, nor on Hazel herself as an individual, nor on Jenny. Hazel and Jenny were first introduced to us as someone who are, in theory, very close to each other. We get to learn all about Jenny's ability to feel Hazel and her emotions. We learn about this borderline magical twin connection they share, and yet almost at the same time, we also learn just how far apart from each other they are. Their dynamic was one of the most difficult ones for me to understand in this book. Right from the get-go, we get this weird feeling that Hazel is jealous of her sister, which honestly is rather understandable due to the circumstances they both are in. We meet Hazel, who is currently living with their parents, who is unable to dance ballet and unsure if she will ever recover enough to continue doing this thing she loves more than anything. While at the same time, she gets to idly observe her sister moving on with her life, attending university, making something out of herself 
finding love. As I said, I understand this jealousy that comes from personal pain mixed with immaturity, but we see that later in life, that jealousy doesn't disappear. If anything, it turns into bitterness. A bitterness that is far from being one-sided, since Jenny harbors the same feelings too. We see that in time, Hazel's and Jenny's roles get reversed. Now Hazel ends up being the one with purpose in life, the one with a job she enjoys and family of her own that loves her unconditionally. While at the same time, we learn about Jenny struggling with alcohol and being stuck in unsuccessful marriage, making Jenny the jealous, bitter one one, and Hazel the one who feels irrationally superior to her sister. And at the end of the day, Hazel and Jenny are two sisters who never learn to truly support each other, to lift each other up, to celebrate each other's victories. As someone who has a sister who is also my best friend, I know firsthand that there is no space for jealousy or resentment in this type of relationship. Honestly, what I would have loved the most for both of them is that before Jenny's untimely demise, they would have found a way to get back to each other. Yes, they were making a bit of a progress, especially with Jenny leaving Ansel and standing back up on her own two feet. But even then, for me, they felt more like strangers, high school friends that could have relied on each other back in the day, but no longer. And that's honestly a pity. All right, let's finish this review by talking a little bit about Ansel himself. When I read about him as a child in Lavender's chapter, I honestly found it difficult to believe that this kind and innocent boy who took care of his brother is the same man who committed crimes awful enough to warrant a death sentence. And yes, we get that scene where Ansel is only three years old, where he disappears into the woods and comes back with a dead animal in his hands, implying to us that this was Ansel's first kill. But after looking at him through the eyes of his mother, I was even playing with the idea that maybe, just maybe, Ansel was wrongly accused. Maybe he's on death row for a crime he didn't commit, which was obviously not the case. Overall, I really enjoyed how the author handled Ansel as a character. We start by seeing his innocence. We continue by learning about his charisma, his intelligence. We know that he wasn't particularly beautiful, but we also know that all the girls in the orphanage were in love with him. The same way we know that Jenny was in love with him and Hazel was jealous of her sister. We are even introduced to Shauna, who is willing to help him escape the prison and eventually share his thoughts with the rest of the world. The author spends time building up his character, this Ted Bundy-like persona who knows how to manipulate women in his life to achieve what he wants, just to slowly break it all apart and show us Ansel for who he really is a mentally ill, sad, and lonely man. We get to know that Shauna was never actually planning to help him. We learn that Jenny left him and found someone better, and we know that Blue refuses to stay in touch with him, all of it being a direct consequence of his own actions. Now, talking about Ansel as a murderer, I can't claim him to be a soulless monster. Often enough, it looks like he wants to change, like he doesn't like the way he is, however, he doesn't want it enough to actually try. We see that he blames this urge to kill on the trauma he experienced as a child, and honestly, I can't even imagine what growing up the way he did what the belief that your brother died in your arms crying from starvation does to a human psyche. But I also see that the only regret he feels now about killing at least the first three girls is that killing them didn't make him feel better. And that leaves me without any doubt that if killing actually reduced the screams in his head, he would continue doing so. Because to himself, he matters more than the lives of his victims. One of the best scenes for me when it comes to Ansel has to be this exchange between him and Shauna. What exactly are you trying to leave? Shauna asked. I don't know. My thoughts? My beliefs? Don't you think it's important to know that something of yourself exists beyond your own body? Something that can outlive death? Shauna only shrugged and said. 
I think some people have left enough already. I just loved this scene, as it encapsulated so perfectly this need of narcissistic criminals to feel immortalized when at the same time they have already left their mark in this world by taking away not only the lives of their victims, but also their identity, their oneselves. Ansel has already immortalized himself by reducing Izzy, Angela, Lila, and Jenny to his victims. Consequently, I love the ending of this book, wrapping up the story by letting us know what Izzy, Angela, Lila, and Jenny could have become, could have achieved, and paying homage to otherwise forgotten victims was just brilliant. But that's just my opinion. What about yours?